one full person, this is Anton. And when it comes to the origin of life on a planet, there are plenty of different mysteries and plenty of questions that cannot be explained even today. But today we're going to be discussing this one mystery that's maybe not as well known and the mystery that's still completely unresolved. Something that we've known about for almost 200 years and something that affects all life on planet Earth. But something that could potentially be somewhat cosmological in nature. But in order for me to explain exactly what we're talking about and to basically then talk about the new study, here I have to start with the really important part of history and the very well-known Frenchman that most of us already know, the microbiologist Louis Pasteur, who's technically known as the father of microbiology and whose name is associated with a lot of different things. I mean, one of them is obviously pasteurized milk. But back in 1848, he discovered a very unusual phenomenon that he could not explain right away. Here he was studying what's known as tartaric acid, and this is actually something you can usually find in grapes and, in his case, in wine. I mean, he's French after all. Now, because he was also good at chemistry, he was able to synthesize some of the tartaric acid instead of extracting it from, for example, grapes. Now, by itself, this was already a pretty big achievement, but what he actually realized when he looked at it through various microscopes and by applying polarized light is that for some reason, both solutions, despite being tartaric acid, were producing entirely different optical observations. Now, the synthesized version was not producing any specific effects and was for the most part neutral. But the acid that was extracted from the grapes ended up shifting polarized light by just a little bit, suggesting that the actual solution from the grapes and the solution produced in the lab was not the same. The synthesized and the natural solutions were producing different optical observations. But in order to figure out what's actually happening here, he then decided to crystallize these liquids to see if they're going to produce the same crystals. And they obviously didn't. They produced something that was a little bit different and something that possessed different effects. Eventually he realized that he discovered something that we never knew about various organic molecules that today we refer to as chirality. Some molecules of tartaric acid were left-handed, but some were right-handed. Today more commonly referred to as dextro and level in organic chemistry. But more importantly, what he actually discovered was the biggest mystery of biology. The synthetic liquid that he created contained both left-handed and right-handed liquids in equal amounts. Kinda makes sense. But the ones he extracted from grapes and other stuff were basically all right-handed. The synthetic acid had two different crystals, but the acid from grapes only had one. And apparently at this point, this was his eureka moment. He exclaimed, L'univers est dissymétrique. He discovered that life, for some reason, had a huge preference for chirality or for the handedness of molecules. Now, in case you've never heard of this before, chirality or handedness applies to most of the complex molecules that can be constructed in three dimensions. So basically here you can produce the same chemical formula, but the actual molecules are going to be different. They're mirror images of each other. And because of this, they actually do not have the same effects. Moreover, it turns out that all sugars on planet Earth are right-handed, whereas all amino acids on planet Earth are left-handed. And they cannot be exchanged for one another because they will not have the same effects. And this biological chirality, for about 180 years now, has sort of remained as one of the biggest mysteries, one of the strangest properties of life on planet Earth that really doesn't make sense. Especially because, except for one exception with bacteria, no life on the planet can use left-handed sugars. Surprisingly, there is only some types of ancient bacteria known to us that can physically change left-handed glucose into right-handed glucose in order to be absorbed later on, but they cannot digest left-handed glucose no matter what. Which also naturally raises a lot of questions. So can other-handed life exist elsewhere? Can we actually have RNA and DNA that's entirely right-handed, creating an entirely different type of life that's technically mirror image of us? And the answer to that is yes. We just don't know if it can exist on planet Earth, and it's probably not going to survive here for one simple reason. It's going to have nothing to eat. It cannot use any resources produced by life on Earth because we are basically left-handed. Or our DNA and RNA are left-handed, and our sugars are right-handed. Okay, I know it's a bit tricky and confusing, but that's basically how it is. And so even though both left-handed and right-handed sugars 
can exist in nature and are often created as both types, only right-handed sugars are used by life. And there's even evidence for chiral organic molecules in outer space in various nebula, although it's not clear which ones are more common. But for practically 200 years now, the scientists have been trying to solve this, and there are several sources for a potential solution. One of them is actually outside of planet Earth. By using organic samples collected from ancient asteroids, it could be possible to determine what sort of chirality is prominent here as well. One of the future studies of the samples from asteroid Bennu is going to be resolving one of these mysteries in the next few years. We don't really have the results yet, but they're coming soon. But the other way is by conducting various experiments here on planet Earth and trying to recreate this in a lab. So basically, can we actually create conditions where certain chirality takes precedence? And various experiments have been conducted in the past, but one conducted very recently. And so, so far, here are some of the potential explanations. The first one is, I guess, more or less simple. It could be an accident. Maybe sometime in the past, one of the molecules became more prominent and eventually became used by most of the life that was developing. Other one kind of disappeared. And though it's a simple explanation, it does kind of make sense. The other explanations actually rely on something from outer space or on various physical elements that were present on early Earth. For example, in some experiments, scientists were able to show that polarized UV light coming from the Sun can increase the destruction of one type of a molecule compared to the other one, resulting in, for example, more right-handed compared to left-handed molecules. Likewise, certain studies suggested that by being in a certain location in a certain nebula when the planets were just forming, it's possible that activity from very powerful stars resulted in huge amounts of radiation that would then destroy certain molecules, which would actually imply that there are probably several stars with several planets that all came from the same nebular cloud that all probably possess these right-handed or left-handed conditions. Likewise, a study from 2020 that we actually discussed previously with a video in the description suggested that cosmic rays, and specifically muons, are often magnetically polarized in such a way that they're going to actually show a little bit more preference for the electrons from, for example, right-handed molecules compared to left-handed, which would increase overall interaction and also mutation, as well as destruction of potential DNA. So basically, in this case, the cosmic radiation itself could preferentially affect right-handed molecules as opposed to left-handed, although other studies have also proposed this to be neutrinos and not cosmic rays. So these are obviously more hypothetical, and this would be very difficult to prove, but they still kind of make sense. But now we have a new proposition that's actually a little bit more exciting than the ones previously, and this one involves an actual experiment that even shows the creation of only right-handed molecules. As always, the study in the description. Here it involves what's known as riboamino oxazoline, also known as RAO. This is a very important precursor to RNA and is also either left-handed or right-handed. Specifically, it ends up producing cytosine or uracil. But like so many other sugars, it can also produce crystallized particles and can thus be studied a lot easier. And just like previously with Pasteur's experiments, it produces either right-handed or left-handed crystals. Although in this case, unlike previous crystals used, this one we know is needed for life. But only one type can be successfully used by life to produce RNA molecules. And so intriguingly, the scientists in this case were able to grow very specific crystals by placing them on magnetite. And when placed on magnetite surfaces, for some reason, the crystallization of this molecule was always 100% producing left-handed amino acid, the one needed for life. But they also were able to then produce opposite molecules also with 100% success by essentially changing the spin alignment or magnetization of the active surface. With the main implication here being that all of this could have been because of magnetic particles that were present all over the surface of early Earth. As a matter of fact, magnetite is often correlated with the existence of early life on the planet. With the main implication being that life might have a preference for handedness because of magnetite and magnetic minerals in primordial times. Although, intriguingly, the scientists suggest that none of this seems to work in liquid, muddy conditions, but seems to mostly work on a rocky surface containing solid magnetite. Nevertheless, here the discovery is really exciting. It produces an experiment that's easy to replicate that creates chiral organic molecules using very similar conditions to primordial Earth which by itself is already quite groundbreaking. 
but it's obviously just the first step in trying to figure this out. As a matter of fact, we've actually discussed previous experiments that try to create synthetic life on the planet using various sources from bacteria, and here it would be interesting to find out if someone could potentially create synthetic life that's entirely mirror to a typical life we find here. And then it would be interesting to see what it's actually going to do. Now, the expectation here is that it's probably not going to survive. It needs to consume mirrored food. It also needs to have all its sugars in mirror format as well. But on the other hand, it's unlikely to be affected by viruses, which would not be able to connect to it. And so what exactly this synthetic mirror life would do on Earth would be a very intriguing question to answer. Although intriguingly, some studies even propose that maybe if such life actually occurs on the planet, it could completely take over everything. Mostly because this bacteria, if it found some kind of a food source, for example, algae that can actually use sunlight, would suddenly find itself without absolutely any predators or any enemies. Nothing could consume it, nothing would want to eat it. Which could potentially lead to a major disturbance of the food chain. And though it does make a pretty cool science fiction story, apparently it has been explored many times, including Star Trek, and more recently, in the Fantastic Four. So this is definitely a concept that has been explored previously, and scientists have thought about it before, but it's not a concept that we still understand very well. But more intriguingly, when it comes to astrobiology, the scientists would love to find out, assuming that life exists out there, is life actually mirror anywhere else, or is it always going to have same-handedness as life on planet Earth? And if so, why? But we'll explore this in some of the future videos. On that note, check out the study in the description below. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support the channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.